I'm a feminist, but tomorrow morning, I hope I wake up with a male prime minister, <laughs> not a female one. <laughs> I feel sick. I really feel oh, sick. I know. Anyway, sorry, I know that it's not very funny. <laughs> Sad future. Um, <laughs> yay, dystopia. Um, I'm a feminist, but as much as I happily talk about feminism with my fiancé all day long, I would just as easily watch him chop wood. <laughs> he would look good chopping wood, actually. He's all a- right, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist... But when our Prime Minister Theresa May said the naughtiest thing she'd ever done was run through a wheat field, for a minute I missed David Cameron allegedly shagging a pig's head. (laughs) Because at least that had personality. (laughs) Just saying, guys. Maybe she's telling us that she's an alien and when you went above her house there was just massive crop circles. (laughs) I mean, is that the Tory options? Shagging a pig... Or, or you're crop a reptilian. Circles. Yeah. Okay. I'm a feminist, but I would forfeit my right to vote if it meant I could have a ponytail as beautiful as Ariana Grande's. <laughs> like, oh my God. Like, I, wa- I was watching One Love Manchester crying three hours straight. I loved it. I thought it was incredible. And the whole time I'm like, oh my God, she is 23 and she has brought this world back together and she's organised it in two weeks and she's got such poise and grace and talent and she's an incredible host. She's gracious. She's emotional. But look at that fucking ponytail. (laughs) So beautiful. And the way she just brings it around in front of her, I'm like, you need to find someone who touches you like Ariana Grande touches her ponytail. (laughs) Also, she wore really baggy clothing, which I think was a sort of feminist act. And it was a sort of, this is not about you looking at my curves and sort of me writhing around inappropriately to pop music. This is about love. It felt like such a generous thing to do to wear baggy clothing. I don't feel people feel that when I do it, though. (laughs) If I turn up, like, in sweats... Like, no, she's... Like, in pyjamas, people go... She's tipped over. She's made no effort. But for her, it felt like it was generous because she was taking the light off her body. Nobody's tweeting if I I do that. I love Ariana Grande so much. Like, I liked her before Sunday. Now, I just think she's incredible. I just love her. She's if she turned up and said, would you leave your fiancé for me? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think she would want to do sexy stuff, though. I think we'd just, like, do colouring in books and, <laughs> like, just share each other's diaries. I'm a feminist, but earlier I tweeted, if Labour don't get in tonight, I hope at least it goes to five sets. <laughs> and someone tweeted back and bring women's tennis up to five sets too <laughs> and I thought that's not relevant and don't be so earnest god feminists are like that sometimes though aren't they <laughs> but then I looked at this person's twitter profile and they described themselves as student vegan unbearable and I liked them again because <laughs> they were self aware yeah they know their game they know self-aware. their game self aware Okay, this is my favourite I'm a feminist but ever that's ever happened to me. Mm. Okay, I'm a feminist but in the middle of trying to write my I'm a feminist buts, I didn't even realise that unconsciously I'd opened YouTube and searched and was watching the scene from Crazy Stupid Love where Ryan Gosling gets his abs out and does dirty dancing body lift and slide on Emma Stone. (laughs) I was just in there going... All right, what could I do for I'm a feminist, but... Do, 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 do. I didn't even know that I had opened that subconsciously going, I just want to look at some people rubbing each other. I want to see Ryan Gosling's abs. What was I doing? Oh, feminism. Oh, no! I oh, know, I ruined it. Live from Warwick Arts Centre, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with Deborah Francis White and guest co host Felicity Ward and very special guest Nat Seema, talking about Nevertheless She Persisted. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities would undermine them. What's your name? Michael. Michael. Are you a fan of the show? He's the one who said on Twitter he was going to wee himself when I booked the tickets because oh, he was so excited. <laughs> oh. Well, I look great now, don't I? Really. I'm always intrigued by our male audience and I'm always thrilled. And I try and lure you in to stay because I want you to bring more male allies. I've been here um, since the beginning. 
Oh, what, in the theatre? <laughs> I mean, we all have. No need to brag. We're all... They bought tickets. You're not special. <laughs> I feel like there was a loadedness to that I've been here since the beginning. It sounded a bit like you knew me before the podcast <laughs> because you'd been following my career. I've been watching you, Deborah. Yeah, exactly. I feel if I went back to your place tonight, there might be one room that only has pictures of me in it. Is that right? <laughs> is there? And your friend is going, there is, there is. <laughs> she lives with me. Oh, oh really? <laughs> you live together? Oh, that's so nice. But, like, separately, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> I get the picture. You'd be available for me. If... I see where you're going with that. I see why you're making it clear. But separately, she's not watching. I see. I see. I see. Okay. Have you ever had a shrine? A shrine? Yeah. What, to myself? No, no. not to yourself. I mean, that is amazing self-worth. If you have... <laughs> Just walked into your house like, yep, this feels tonally right. <laughs> I've never had a shrine. I've never Have you built had a an obsession with someone and then had all of posters of them all over your wall? Yeah, the monkeys when I was at high school. Please do not think I am as old as the monkeys. <laughs> I was retro. Back the in monkeys... the Jurassic period. <laughs> I was retro. It was the monkeys and the Beatles I really liked when I was at school. Mm. Thank you. Another fan in. Um, that's actually Mickey Dolans. He comes to all my gigs. <laughs> Uh, Mickey Dolenz is one of the monkeys. It's really a much funnier joke. If Look at the age understand. of them, mate. I know. <laughs> they probably just, think you're talking about actual monkeys. <laughs> yeah. just, just cheer if you know who the monkeys are. Yeah. See? Give us a cheer if you know who the monkeys are after watching that episode of The Simpsons. Woo. Yes! <laughs> Don't be ashamed. Oh, I learned so much about life through oh. The Simpsons. He's 12. It's amazing he knows who The Simpsons are. <laughs> The Simpsons are quite retro now, I think. Um, So today our theme is Nevertheless She Persisted. Do people know where this has come from? Yeah. Tell the story anyway. I will tell the story anyway. Nevertheless She Persisted is a widely used motto in the feminist movement. Who said it? Elizabeth Warren. No, about Elizabeth Warren. It was about Elizabeth Warren, correct. Who said it about Elizabeth Warren? The devil. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, Mitch McConnell. Yes, the devil uttered this sentence during comments following the vote in an effort to defend the Senate's actions and blame Elizabeth Warren. So she was complaining about the confirmation of Jeff Sessions. Because he's been stolen from a garden as a garden gnome and he can't do both jobs. No. (laughs) Because... It's just a small, lost little man looking for his hat in the White House. No. If you can be both a member of Parliament and run the Evening Standard, then you can both be a garden gnome (laughs) and also the Attorney General now because he has a terrible civil rights record and she was quoting a statement by Ted Kennedy saying that he was basically unfit. She says, I will stand with Senator Kennedy and I will cast my vote against the nomination of Senator Sessions. And he basically closed her down. He said she was told, she was warned, and nevertheless she persisted. But of course what she was persisting to do was to say, you cannot put this man forward and allow him all this influence because he's a racist. And we thought it was particularly salient tonight because the election... Um, oh, now, nevertheless, she persisted. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and we're... <laughs> go away, Theresa May. I know, I know, I know. May, and May, go away. We're Don't going come to... come back another day. It may be a time when we're going to need feminism because austerity hits women the hardest. Women are often disenfranchised. We may be going to need a hell of a lot of feminism. And I know that a lot of female MP candidates this time have had a lot of abuse on Twitter as well and a lot of actual letters delivered to them with horrible misogynistic things in them. So we might need feminism altogether tonight. Now, I know you know, people in this audience will have voted different ways. Some of you will have voted Labour. Some of you will have voted Women's Equality Party if you had someone uh, standing in your constituency. Some of you will have voted Green and some of you will have voted Lib Dem. Um, <laughs> uh, now... Uh, Look, if you have voted Tory, you are welcome to change. And <laughs> I don't think there's a huge crossover with UKIP voters and guilty feminist listeners. I think that Venn diagram is likely to be very small. Um, yeah, but I mean, that, we're all that would together. be a guilty feminist. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I'm also a member of UKIP. Lol. <laughs> Naughty me. I don't think. If you're an international listener, please understand that our election is happening right now. Well, not right now, because by the time you're listening to this, you're in the future. And you know the election result, Um, listeners. 
you're probably listening to us with some irony. Uh, but if you are, we have a lot of international listeners, so it's the United Kingdom general election. So we're deciding both who our members of parliament are and also by default who the prime minister will be. And our prime minister, Theresa May, was asked in an interview to try... <laughs> Sadly, the thing was, the interviewer was trying to make her seem more human. <laughs> Uh, hashtag irony <laughs> said oh what naughty things did you do when you were a child to try and just you know give her a bit of personality a bit of background but it was like asking Darth Vader <laughs> what's the naughtiest thing you ever did Darth Vader <laughs> <laughs> I was an only child <laughs> you've never seen Star Wars have you <laughs> That's, right. a, that's an old man it. trying to get something out of the cupboard. <laughs> okay, you do, Darth Vader. I mean, for that a is start. Better. Okay, that is better. That is better. I've given you that. My name is <laughs> Teresa. <laughs> and I run through wheat fields <laughs> like a naughty little girl. <laughs> Okay, that was a lot better. Yeah, I see that. I see yeah, that now. I'm yeah. gonna... Do yours again. Do yours again. <laughs> oh, oh. Have you seen the Dark Crystal? I mean, we're going way back there. The Skeksis. Mm. Just saying. Mm. I'm just saying. Please welcome to the State Felicity Ward. <laughs> um, I started... Uh, swimming a couple of years ago because the doctor said it would be good for my... Uh, His words, not mine. A little bit hurtful. A little bit hurtful, if I'm honest. So I had to find a way that I could enjoy swimming, and I can now because a couple of... uh, Last year, I bought myself underwater headphones. Yes, they exist. That's the correct noise. <laughs> it's like, do you ever watch those YouTube videos of deaf babies that get a cochlear implant and then they hear their mum's voice for the first time and you're crying, you're like, I should go to work and stop eating biscuits. <laughs> it is like that every time I swim when I have these on and it's amazing. And actually, the headphones have improved my times. Do you know how motivating it is swimming to the theme song from Jaws? Ah! Oh! <laughs> I mean, my anxiety is through the roof! <laughs> but record time, guys, record time. And I swim all over the country. Anywhere I go, I swim. And you have a beautiful invention over here called Women's Only Swimming. And that is a lovely thing where only women are allowed to get in the pool and stand on either side of the divider and then just talk to each other in the middle of my fucking lane. <laughs> now, I'm a feminist, right? I'm a dirty, filthy, commie, pinko, femo. Yeah? <laughs> But by the end of Women's Only Swimming, I'm just about ready to join a men's rights activist group, honestly. <laughs> just like, get back to the kitchen, Hazel. Just put... <laughs> Why don't we give you the vote? <laughs> I mean, you're so old, you probably gave me the vote, but go and get your fucking bone density somewhere else. <laughs> That's a joke. You can't get bone density from swimming. So... <laughs> But the thing is, it's very expensive to swim over here and I don't think that you should have to pay to use the pool over here, but I do think you should have to do a test before you go in. I've written one, don't worry about it. Um, So, uh, lovely here, what's your name? Catherine. Catherine. And do you swim, Catherine? You do. Can you tumble turn? No. Okay, good. Do you ever think that you can? No. Oh, because sometimes I do. (laughs) I've been swimming for like a while, I'm like, maybe I can tumble turn. And then I go to do it at the end, and then I just end up drowning in a circle. So, (laughs) Catherine, I'm going to present you with a scenario and some multiple choice answers, just an A, B or C, and you're going to let me know what you think the right answer is. It's very, very simple, and that's the test that you would have to take to get into my pool, not a euphemism. Okay. (laughs) So here's the scenario. I'm an 86-year-old with the spirit of a 20-year-old, but the physical capabilities of an 86 year old. (laughs) I like stopping halfway down the pool and also I hate other people being happy. (laughs) Should I swim in the slow, medium or fast lane? (laughs) Catherine, what do you think? Slow, close, they need to invent a lane for me called not drowning but still keep an eye on me. (laughs) It is so frustrating watching idiots try to determine their own speed. There's no order, there's no control, they won't give me a whistle. (laughs) 
And if someone's in the wrong lane, I'll go and tell on them. I'll tell the lifeguard, which my British friends get very upset about. They're like, you can't go and say something. I'm like, well, it's very hard to tut underwater, I've found. <laughs> get a lot of water in the lungs, you end up drowning. It ruins the whole point of complaining in the first place. So I'll go over to the lifeguard, tell them what's going on. They agree with me, obviously. And then I get back in the pool and they don't do anything about it. If you are going to acknowledge there's a problem and then take no action, why don't you go and work for the fucking UN, mate? <laughs> No one at the pool takes their job seriously except for one person I met and she was right up the other end of the spectrum. Hoo, Nelly! So I went to the pool on one of those um, hot days that you sometimes have here and uh, (laughs) so adorable the way British people deal with the sun. Oh, my God, I love it. I don't know if you were here last July. We had two days over 25 degrees in a row (laughs) and the whole city was acting as if the Nazgul had flown in overhead. Everyone's like, it's a heat! Save the children, get them inside, it's a heatwave. It's like, no, you've got the word mixed up, it's summer. You are in an abusive relationship with your own weather. You get one sunny day, you're like, see, he can't be like this, we're just going through a bad year. No, it's shit, mate, it's always shit. So I go up to the lady at the pool and I say, I would like to get into the pool, please. And she says, the pool is closed. And I said, why? And she looks over both shoulders and she leans in and she goes... There's been a foreign contaminant. And I'm like, you can't call us that. And then I realised what she was talking about. I'm like, mate, you don't work for the FBI. Did someone do poo? She's like, yeah, someone did poo. Plural. Plural. I can't get that out of my head. I'd love to just, like, iron on past that, but I can't. Because if you've had a kid and you sneeze and you're swimming, you could probably accidentally do a wee. You can't accidentally do a shit. That's a choice. That's someone swimming along going, I reckon I got this. Like, that is... That's a self-confidence that I don't have. I don't know what you would do apart from... All I can think is, like, don't look at someone in the eye. That's the only hint that I... Because if you look at someone in the eye, you're like... That would give it away, wouldn't it? I do yoga regularly. Like, I can't function unless I'm doing it once every two years. And I'm basically addicted. Um, But I tried hot yoga for the first time last year. And it's okay. My only criticism, probably a bit hot. And if you haven't done hot yoga before, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a group of strangers stretching in the flames of hell. It is... It's it's 40 degrees and that's not an exercise temperature. That's a bushfire warning. And... You've got to go to yoga for a long time because they use code words to try and trick you. Like, sometimes they'll use the phrase dynamic pose and what that actually means is very painful. (laughs) And then they have another code word, which is chavasana, and what that means is you get to have a little sleep at the end of the class. Ooh, I love chavasana. (laughs) I love chavasana. I wish there was a class that was just chavasana. (laughs) Like for an hour and then you could be like dressed in active wear and your friends would go, oh, where are you going? You're like, sorry, I've got to go to my Chavasana class. Namaste. Okay, bye. <laughs> and they think that you're going to exercise when actually you're just getting away from them. <laughs> but I can't go back to yoga anymore. I've reached my end with it because they have insensitive teachers. Every class that I go to, they say this at some point. When you're on your knees, they say, all right, everyone, um, just pop your foreheads on the mat. Now, anyone with a small nose will think nothing of that. (laughs) If you've born with this on the side of your face, there's no such thing as pop your forehead on the mat. (laughs) You need to have a blueprint, you need to have a situation room, you need to have a discussion about whether you're going to go to the side, go up, go down. (laughs) This doesn't just happen. You can't just pop your forehead on the mat. It's the same when you're at a party. Anyone with a big nose will know that a tray of champagne flutes strikes fear into our hearts. Because we can't just casually drink a champagne flute. You have to do one of two things. You either have to put it on the inside of the glass and then just take gentle little sips like you've never worked a cup before. Or alternatively, you have to stick your nose on the outside of the glass and then tip your entire head back like an idiot on a dentist commercial. I just leave it there. <laughs> Please put your hands together for the wonderful comedian, BAFTA nominated filmmaker, who, and novelist, Natla Seema. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Nat, and I'm bringing the death of hope. (laughs) 
so we did challenges, which I thought could be quite good fodder. Did you do a challenge flick? I've sort of been doing a challenge. Uh, I don't know which way to go with this. I genuinely feel like at the moment that this phrase is very much in my brain and the way that I'm living at the moment. I have a lot of personal stuff going on and also I have mental health stuff as I talked about before and I talk about all the time and I don't, you know, I'm, I'm into it. Um, quite, I don't even, this is not a very good thing to say, I don't even mind the stigma of mental illness. You know how there's all these campaigns that are like, fight the stigma, fight. I don't mind the stigma because if people think I'm unpredictable, it gives me the space to decide whether or not I'm going to take my meds. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm not on meds. Ah! <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> but I, so... <laughs> the thing with Flick is you genuinely never know. I mean, you never know. No, I'm not, I'm not on medication, but the therapy thing was real. <laughs> no, she is extremely good Mentally value. ill. Oh, sorry. And <laughs> we've got a very small dressing room upstairs. It's like sharing it with a lit firework. <laughs> <laughs> very unpredictable. But pretty, but mm. very scary. Just like a Katy Perry song. <laughs> it's so true. I love pop music. I am the human physical embodiment in show business of Nevertheless She Persisted. Mm. I mm. honestly feel I am the walking Nevertheless She Persisted. Comedy is very, very hard if you're a woman. You only need to watch Mock the Week to understand our chances for career advancement. There is one chair on the end for the woman one. Booked in October. Zoe Lyons came on the show and told the audience that there's a special woman's chair and they justify it by saying, well, we always have a certain sort of comedian, something like a political comedian or something, and they always have to sit in their chair. And if we have like a gag comedian, they have to sit in their chair. But that's like woman is a genre then. It's a really, really difficult industry for women. But what I've discovered is if you won't go away, like if you just won't leave... If you just relentlessly keep showing up again and again and again, eventually the industry does go, all right then. <laughs> okay, you're not leaving, so we have to find something for you to do. I mean, that is literally it. That, that, that is, is literally it. And just for sake of honesty, I feel like I am at the end of my persistence at the moment. I feel like I don't know if I have a knock to give on the door at the moment. And I, I say this only so we're not all just going, yeah, we just got to keep trying and that's what we do. We just pull up our bootstraps. That's really not where I'm at at the moment. So last year I worked myself and have done for years and years, worked myself into burnout and not like, oh, I don't know if I can go partying this weekend. Like burnout, like my only day off I spend in bed not knowing how to get up, not knowing how to clean the house, not knowing how to feed myself because I'm exhausted all the time. So I did this thing this year where I made a new rule for myself, which was I'm only allowed to do stand-up three nights a week and special occasions if something comes up. Like the Guilty Feminist? Like the Guilty Feminist, so do, are we, absolutely. Do, will we you break four? your rule for us? Are, you, yes, are we number I'm, four this week? Yes. Sweet! Yes. Um, Sorry, your mental health is much more important. That, <laughs> Sorry. No, no, but it was so that if something came up, I wouldn't have a panic attack and go, oh, no, I've got to cancel two more shows mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And so I did that and I have been loving stand-up more than I have in years. I've been having the best time with it. And I really made peace with my career about a month ago and I just went, right, all these things that you're chasing... At the beginning of this year, I went back to Australia and there is a show that I did five years ago that has been optioned by a production company and we're just, like, as of last week, starting to pitch it to networks and we went back and did writing development days while I was back in Australia and I have never felt as happy, as fulfilled, as joyed, as surrounded by people who were facing in the same direction that when I described a character, they heard it in the way that I described it and then were able to, like, make suggestions that everyone was just focused. And so when I came back to the UK, I went, right, I want to do things that make me feel like that mm -hmm. again. That's what I want to do. And if I'm not going to get success the way that is supposed to or the pathway, then I've got to start carving it myself. And I thought about those things that we chase or that things that help us sell tickets, TV shows and stuff like that. And when I thought about it in my guts, I'm like, actually, that doesn't make me feel very good. But I will do them if they come up, And but it will be like I'll follow my heart. And then I got asked to audition for something and then I got asked to audition for something else and these two things, they just spun me. And what I thought I'd done at the beginning of this year is I thought that I had made time and space for my mental health and that my career would bloom because I love what I'm doing so much and actually what's happened is all of this personal shit has come in and filled up those other nights. There's a lot going on outside of my career within my life that has been very, very hard this year, incredibly, incredibly hard this year. 
and now I'm at the point where everything else is pulling me down so much, I don't know how to knock on the door one more time. I did not know that and I have to say I find it really amazing because for me, I think of you as someone who's extremely successful in comedy, who's extremely high energy. I'm it's hearing just my this, shoulder pads, mate. That's I'm, all it is. <laughs> but I'm hearing this for the first She's time so on stage. She's wide below her head. And there's something that sort of slightly shocking about it. It's a bit like... You know when that couple break up that are your particular poster child for monogamy and you go, well, monogamy works because Andrew and Karen or Peter and Bob, you know, you just kind of hold them as your poster. And when they break up, you go, well, if they can't make it, no one can. Mm. A little bit like that, hearing Felicity Ward talk about maybe the end of... It's not the end. I've got no other skills. No, no, this I'm is not saying the, the end, only but, you know, thing that I can But do. the fact that you would consider not knocking on the door again, I'm like, but no, but you're really successful and lively and, you know... I'm lively, but they're not the same thing. <laughs> like, successful and lively are yeah, very you different. You seem to me to be very successful as a stand-up comic. And I... OK, I'm just going to lay it on the table here now. I think because of the election, I'm just going to be incredibly fucking honest. I got into comedy, and I was doing a show I, very early on. I didn't do many clubs because my second ever show got picked up to tour. And other comedians would say, well, if your show is touring venues, sort of venues like this, you know, here and in Australia. And they said, if your show is touring, you know, decent sized venues, you don't want to do the circuit. You're off touring your show. So I thought I didn't really have to do the circuit and I wanted to be doing my own show. But I got an agent because there was a sort of, you know, a little bit of buzz around me. And that agent, I'm, yeah, I'm just going to say it. That agent used to make me feel so bad about myself. And whenever I'd say, oh, well, maybe we should get some TV people in to have a look at me for maybe, you know, some of those shows just to get a bit more profile that agent would say, they don't want women on television. I couldn't get... Feeling a sort of previously successful female comedian, if I can't get her on television, I'll never get you on television. And basically what happened was the BBC did one of those studies. They do these every five years. It was on the front page of all the broadsheets. They'd spent £500,000 to find out that there were no women on the television. <laughs> maybe it wasn't £500,000. Maybe it was £250,000. But it was a lot. They'd spent a lot of money... It was more than ten ...to find out that there was no women on the telly. And they said, oh, we need more women on the telly. So I said to the agent, hey, they at least have to take meetings at the moment. I give good meeting. Shall we try and get a meeting? And the agent said, no, there's no point. They don't mean it. And then someone from the BBC who knew me rang me and said, hey, we need to be taking meetings with women. Will you come in? So I had to manage my agent very carefully. And I said, hey... I've been asked in for this meeting. You're probably right. They probably don't mean it, but I might as well go. And he said, call me as soon as you get out of the meeting. And I called him and he said, this isn't working. Because if you're going to get your own meetings, there's no point. It was so discouraging that I nearly gave up then. I was just... Because everything was taking off for me. There were so many different things taking off. But then I had no agent. And then if you've got no agent, often they lack confidence in you or you just can't get past the right gatekeepers. So I had three years with no agent. And I managed to get my own Radio 4 series in that time. And I would write off to agents. I thought then it would be really easy because I had my Radio 4 series with my name in the title and I would write off. And I remember one email that I got. It was from a woman. And it said... I'm sorry, but I cannot consider anybody of the female persuasion. <laughs> like I'd been persuaded to be female, inadvisedly, in a bar one oh, night. Oh, all right, you've twisted my arm. I know. <laughs> and then she said, that might sound sexist, but it's not. It's not. Oh, you're wrong then. Because yes. you thought it was sexist, but you're wrong. Like, okay, cool. Like, silly that is woman. The, silly, it is silly the definition woman. of sexism. All I'd said was, could you come and watch the show? There's all this Radio 4 thing happening. Just come and have a look at the show. I hadn't said, sign me, because unless they like you or they're into you, it, you know, it's not the right person. But she said, I'm not going to come to your show because you're a woman. And I was just like, well, that is the definition of sexism. Then she said, it's not me that's sexist, it's the industry. So I wrote back and said, we are the industry. I'm a comedian, you're an agent. If we're not going to change things, who is? And then I sent off another one to somebody I had a connection with. And she wrote back and said, I'm sorry, we're a bit saturated at the moment, girl-wise. Or what, you have two? Yeah, have two. yeah. And I wrote... There's and women said, everywhere. I'm cluttered in vagina. Saturated <laughs> with... It is. Ew. You know in the in-betweeners when they used to say, we'll be knee-deep in clunge? <laughs> That's what it sounded like to me. Yeah. Saturated girl-wise. So I wrote back to her and said, just out of interest, what percentage of your clients are female? What does saturation look like girl-wise? Because I thought, I'm not a girl, I'm a woman. Come on. And it, just the thing is, if in banking or law that someone wrote that, they would be, you know, they just would, they'd be sued and fined. I mean, it just wouldn't happen. But it's just normal in comedy. And it got to the point where I just thought, I can't go on. And then I started doing The Guilty Feminist. And in a very real way, I'll be honest with you, you guys have saved me. 
because you guys demonstrated that when I put it out on a podcast, there was an audience of people who wanted to hear what I had to say. Now, the industry obviously has become a lot more interested in me since I've got this show because we've had 12 million downloads in 18 months. And the industry now, funnily enough, are less keen to write me emails saying, because you're a girl, we don't want you. Because now they're saying, oh, because you're a girl... Mm -hmm. We want but it's you. tiring, isn't it? It's really tiring because you feel like you're running to stand still and you yeah. feel like you have to make a success of yourself and then someone will come after you and be like, I can help you be a success. And you're like, yeah, get fucked. I already am. So yeah. I, But I must um, say, the people who are representing me now really do believe in me and my current comedy agent like, was just starting and taking off. So they're not people who've sort of come on and I certainly didn't go with anybody who treated me like that earlier. I have amazing keep people. calling them your current agent so they stay on their toes. <laughs> <laughs> I do it with my boyfriend. (laughs) If you're listening, if you're listening. Will you put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Deborah Francis (laughs) So there are things we should persist at. Things like feminism, we should persist. Sometimes you just want to give in, but you should persist at feminism. There are things we shouldn't persist at that we do, like season eight of Ally McBeal. <laughs> I persisted with that, and it wasn't, there was no reason to. I knew at the time I was wasting my time, and yet I watched every episode. You know when a show has jumped the shark, but you can't let it go? <laughs> like a bad relationship, right? Like a boyfriend or a girlfriend who's let you down time and again. You know they don't love you. You know you're not in love with them, but you can't admit that you're single again. So I'm going to get some things from you now that you think we should persist at. Just shout something you've persisted at and you're pleased you have. I'll start yoga. took me ages to get into a place with yoga where my body wanted to do it more than my head. And I'm so happy I persisted at yoga because if I'm feeling tense and miserable and premenstrual and like there's no point to anything and I hate you all, If I just go into a little bit of downward facing dog, like right now, I've had a long day, just hold this. I've had a long day and you've all had a drink, most of you. I haven't had a drink because I can't have a drink because it's my job to be five seconds ahead of you mentally. So I've had no drink. So I'm feeling a bit like, oh, but now I'm going to do this. (laughs) Heels to the floor just quietly. For those of you at home, Deborah is now going into plank. Now she's coming up into cobra. Now she's going into downward dog and rolling up. Persistence. Persistence. And for those of you who realise my dress is shorter at the back than it is at the front at the same time I did, sorry. For those of you who'd realised that I'd worn a thong so I had no visible panty line at the same time I did, sorry. But now Michael over here is wishing I'd done it the other way. Um, he's not, is he? No. Yeah, Michael just said I swing the other way. Yeah, it's disappointing for everybody, Michael. Um, except your many and varied boyfriends. Do you have many and varied boyfriends? Unfortunately not. No, okay. No. Tragically not. You're so cute though, Michael. I feel I could find you someone. See, are you Michael's mum? <laughs> Never say that, oh, Deborah, God. ever. No, it's not because you're not because you look great. It's not because you look after me, mum. It was the way you stroked him maternally. I'm a mum. You're a mum, but not Michael's mum. Five and two. Okay, I'm so sorry. Honestly. Now, this is where... It was the way you stroked him. It was the way you stroked him. This is where, as a comedian, you need not to persist. You need to just draw a line and move on. Because if you keep on... It's only going to make it worse for you, for Michael, and Michael's mum. And look, now I see you don't look anywhere near old enough to be Michael's mum. Honestly, I just saw a shadowy figure, because I can't really see you because of the dark, and I just saw you go like this, like a mum going, oh, it's all right, darling, you'll find someone one day. And I have a great desire to have a gay son. And if I could adopt a gay son... Okay, Michael... I'm open to it, I'll be honest with you. I realise there's no romantic future for us, but nevertheless she persisted that maybe you could be my child. See what I'm saying there, guys? You can make it work in a different way. See if we can fit it a different way. How old are you, Michael? I am 24 tomorrow. 24 tomorrow! 
Am I your birthday present, Michael? <laughs> birthday present to myself from me. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't really count, now. <laughs> that doesn't really count. I'm driving to Scotland in the morning to see my mum. Oh, oh, your real natural. mum. My real mum. <laughs> your real mum, not your adopted mum, who's basically the same age. <laughs> who, no. no, no, basically the same... Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> So what I'm saying, guys, is, uh, is, is sometimes there are things that we should persist at, like feminism, and sometimes there are things that we should let go, like Michael. <laughs> and it's important to know the difference. So I want you to just shout out something that you've persisted at, that you're glad you've persisted at. One, two, three. Teaching. Teaching. Yeah. Teaching. Well done. And listen, if there's a Tory government in tomorrow and you're immediately let go... <laughs> That probably is the case. Listen, there's other things, like being Michael's friend. I don't know what else there is. Teaching? Teaching? Who do you teach? I teach secondary drama. Secondary drama! We need you. We desperately need you. What else are you pleased you persisted at? Writing a play. Taking bloods. Are you legally allowed to do that? (laughs) That's your actual job. Yeah, yeah, you've got qualifications. Then great, let's celebrate that. (laughs) Celebrate that. Are you a nurse? No. Oh, you hate to take it at the beginning because the blood was warm. Are you a phlebotomist? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. I know that because my brother in law is one of those, so I know a fancy word. <laughs> phlebotomist is someone who takes blood. So you're a phlebotomist. Again, presumably, if the Tory government does get in immediately, well, I mean, I don't know. Theresa May may want you to collect blood. <laughs> but for nefarious reasons, she's got to eat somehow. Um, shout out something that you wish you hadn't persisted at. Running. Running. <laughs> what happened? It's just horrendous. It's just horrendous, but you're still doing it? No. No, she's not persisted. She's basically gone, no, it's horrendous. It hurts. Have you taken up something else instead of running? Uh, yoga. Yoga, yes. My friend, my sister, absolutely. For people like you and me, who are not life's runners and jumpers, we need something quiet and calm that we can do one pose into another while breathing in and out heavily. <laughs> Indoor so no one can see you. Okay, that's a bit sadder than I thought it was going to be. Um, anything else? What else have you persisted at that you wish you hadn't? <laughs> feeling guilty. Yes! Fuck feeling guilty. We're going to let that go. Okay. Are you still doing it now? 100%. 100% you're doing it right now? Yeah. What are you feeling guilty about? Feeling guilty that I said it to other people. <laughs> I mean, what is wrong with women? I mean, that is extraordinary. I spoke, and someone else might have wanted to speak. They didn't. No one else spoke at the same time. Still no one else has spoken, but they might have wanted to. I might have been speaking at a time when someone else wanted to speak but wasn't speaking. I should have just left silence hang in the air rather than have my useless voice take up space in the airwaves. Seriously now. Yes, let it fucking go. Let's give up feeling guilty. What else have you persisted at? Teaching. Teaching? Persistent, I shouldn't have. She should have, I shouldn't have. Okay, so she should have kept teaching. Senior school drama, what are you teaching? I I was teaching uh, senior school English. Senior school English, you were? Oh, you were Robin Williams in Dead Poets Society. (laughs) And all the children were standing on the desks for you. Had you got yourself into a tricky situation with a student? (laughs) Because it did not end well in Dead Poets. Did you just walk out the door one day and just go, this isn't for me? What do you do now? I'm a nurse. Hey! Well, what, I think what we've learned here today is some things are worth persisting at. For some people, it's teaching. For some people, it's nursing. For some people, it's phlebotomy. For all of those things, let's hope like fuck that austerity doesn't withdraw the funding. We've got to keep fighting because we do need to keep persisting, whether it goes our way tonight or not. Like, whatever you want, I think we all want the NHS funded. Is that correct? Yeah. We all want well-funded schools, so let's hope it goes our way tonight and let us persist with this show in the hope that it does. Thank you very much. Now, I was having a wonderful old time over there and then you started talking about the NHS and then I got very emotional. Um, oh, Sorry. So, um, I'm, this is not a local accent, obviously. I wasn't going to say any of this stuff. These are not jokes. But in Australia, you have to pay to see a psychotherapist. You have to pay to get mental health. If you earn under a certain amount, 
you can get 10 free sessions a year and that's it. That's all you can get in a whole year. If you earn over a certain amount, you can be eligible for 50% off, but you pay usually approximately $120 per session with a psychotherapist. So you're paying $60 a week. That's with the discount. And I have been fortunate enough that I've been through the NHS to get cognitive behavioural therapy twice and it saved my life. And uh, I wish that I could tell people that aren't in this room because I assume that most of you are into the NHS and don't mind putting in a pound here and a pound there so that we can fund this wonderful thing. If you ever think that the NHS doesn't do incredible work, let me tell you that it saved my life and it's an amazing thing and I'm very grateful that I can live here. (laughs) Sorry. I, uh, I did. I did. I don't know why I got so upset. It was. It's just like the idea that that wouldn't be here is baffling to me. It is the greatest thing about this country. It. It isn't the people in London. Tell. Let me tell you that. That's not the greatest thing in this country. Uh, but anyway, I. Uh... <laughs> I need to... Nat, can you talk? Please? Yes, yes. Um, OK, I can tell you that I'm feeling... I, I feel very much the same when you talk about feeling... That sometimes you're just so tired with, like, constantly persisting. And, like, I spent about seven years being a stand-up comedian and hearing a lot of what you were hearing, which was just like, oh, we've got a lot of women right now, and they mean, like, you know, 6%. I always thought that to get ahead, you just had to keep slogging at it. That was always the way I was taught. Like, keep trying. If you're good enough, boys would always say, just be undeniably good. Just, just be, be undeniably, undeniable. Good. Oh, every good. time and then nobody can argue that you're not good and it's like because comedy is scientific <laughs> okay fine but what I did instead was I went and wrote a short film and I sent the script to people and they were like a couple of production companies like we don't like it so I was like fine so I made it by myself like 800 quid with my friend and a crew of students I sent it to my agent she said it's kind of scrappy I'd be embarrassed to send it to anyone sorry and then nine months later it was nominated for a BAFTA And that's when you think, I don't know why you lot are here. Mm. Like, I don't know what is the point of you when you're just slowing me up. And so every time I hear no, I do something else. So then I went and wrote a book. And now I'm on my third book and I'm pitching my fourth now. And then when I hear a no there, fine, I'll go and screenwrite. And I hear a no there and I'll go and direct. And then I think at a certain point, like Deborah says, like you're just so all pervasive like rot in a house that Mm. you're like well you ignored me and now the house is collapsing and I'm going to live in the ruins and I'm going to be very happy in the ruins it's not the greatest analogy but but I stand by it because I always thought like when people say no keep persuading them and I always thought that with relationships as well that when people didn't like you you'd be like I'll make you like me it's like what's the end result of that is you have a boyfriend who thinks you're a dick Mm. Um, well done I'll buy a hat Um, so yeah what I do now is I go to where I feel wanted and liked Mm. and actually can I come yes come with because it's so much like as soon as I hear stupid bullshit from people I'm like cool I'll do something else can I say though I do think because Nat got nominated for a BAFTA as she said for a short film and then has had several feature scripts. She made a trailer for a feature film, which was called Annie Has Body Issues, which was so good. The trailer was so exciting, so funny. It had two women in the leads, but it wasn't like a, you know, like there's that sort of genre of women's films. It's got to be chick lit. It's got to be Bridget Jones falling down or something like that. And it was a murder film. Yeah, it was, it was inc- a bit was, more shallow grave. It was, it was like a dark comedy. Yeah, a girl wakes up in the morning after a really messy house party and there's a dead body on the sofa. And it's the body of the girl who just stole her boyfriend. And she doesn't really remember last night. And she's like, I'm sure I didn't do it. But I'm not 100%, so let's not do anything rash. And then she and her friend have to, like, get rid of the body, but also feeling very guilty about it. But also no one wants to go to prison, so... And they don't like her, so... And it's like, it's, you know, it's about being an awful person, but wanting to be happy. That's called Annie Has Body Issues, which I think was a brilliant title. Um, But there's a scene in the trailer because Nat basically put the money together to make the trainer, where she and her friend who are hiding the body, and the body is starting to smell, and someone's come along, and they're retching, and they're going, what is that? And they're like, nothing, and they're going, (laughs) and trying not to... It's so incredibly funny, and it was so stylish the way it was put together. And I can't help feeling that if you were a guy with a really funny Shallow Grave-style project it would have been funded. And I just feel like if anybody's listening to this, can you please 
look at Nat Latsima's scripts. Can you please fund Nat Latsima's film? She's got lots of scripts and she's relentlessly hardworking and it actually isn't fair. She's been nominated for a BAFTA for an £800 film. It isn't fucking fair. There's just so many guys that seem to come out of Oxbridge and then sort of fall into a pile of money and turn that into a sort of, you know, maybe okay or maybe mediocre film or maybe it's brilliant, I don't know. But I do see women filling out many more forms trying very much harder. And listen, we're speaking from a place of privilege where we'd even be thinking about making a film and I do get that. But it's important to see female stories. I went to see this amazing film the other night with the incredible Jessica James with Jessica Williams in it. She's an amazing African-American actor that you might know from The Daily Show or Two Dope Queens. She's an actor and comedian. And it was just a female lead story, but it wasn't a women's film or it wasn't, you know, she just got to do regular things. And I think we do need to, and if, if not, we can have a whip round here, like a Kickstarter. <laughs> I mean, how much do you need, Nat? A million. Right, Sorry. okay. Um, <laughs> so if everyone I, you know can just put in 50 grand, just, that'd be... Yeah. <laughs> just Michael talks. must be able to put up half that. Do you know what? I honestly, I honestly did think about like crowdfunding it and doing it on the cheap, and I thought, I'm not doing it on the cheap because I'm not making my first feature and having people be like, oh, you know, it's, it shows promise. It's like I'm tired of showing promise. I've uh, been promising hmm. and I've been emerging for a decade. My dad used to say there's nothing worse than having good potential. Yeah, uh, like how long I don't think your dad should say that to you, though. <laughs> he was because saying it about himself. Oh, I thought you were seven years old and going, my teacher said that shows potential. Well, that's shit. <laughs> what you want to show is achievement and then a yeah. buck. That's when you want to show Felicity. Absolutely. Like, what do you do, Michael, just out of interest? I am a theatre manager. You were a theatre manager? Money. Oh. That is the money, mate. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you Where are you managing the million? What was that? Where is the money? Yeah. Arts it's Council funding. Can I just quickly say also that I don't, and I, I'm not trying to back out of this, but I don't necessarily blame my success or lack thereof because I'm a woman, but I was just saying that's where I am now and I think that sometimes we hear a lot of, I'm an empowered woman and I just keep turning up and sometimes you got to hear someone saying, I'm having a real bad time mm-hmm. and I'm not where I wanted to be and I thought I would be further and this is a bit hard. Yeah. Does anybody have a charity? What? Yes. Oh. What's yours? I, I work for Sense, which is the National Deaf Blind Charity. So we work with people who have multisensory impairments and other complex disabilities. And having persisted in theatre with Michael for many years, I chucked it to go and be paid more money being the boss for once, uh, having been managed by men for years and years and years. And I'm going to run a centre called Touch Base Pairs in Selly Oak in Birmingham, which is a public building, which is designed, and it's very much harking back to what we heard earlier in the evening about the visibility of people with disabilities. So it's a public building with a public cafe and public activities, but it's also going to house a day centre for people with complex disabilities. So we're bringing our local community together with the people we support so that they can see each other and exist in the same space. Great. And... Um, can we donate to that somewhere online? Yes, so we have a website which is letsbuildtouchbase.org or www.sense.org.uk. Tom's going to give you a carp so that if anyone would like to put a couple of quid in tonight, Laura's going to be standing at the door. That would be much appreciated. Uh, Felicity, have you got anything to plug? Oh, thanks for asking, Deb. I, um, I am um, affiliated with a, a homeless charity called Together in Barnet. They're doing a walk this Sunday, which won't make any sense um, because this will mm-hmm. go out later. But basically what they do is they provide free housing from um, October through to April. There's about 17 churches and different religious houses. It started off as a grassroots movement. They're now an official charity just so they can get more funding and they provide a place to stay every night for these people and they're really, really great anyway it's just together in barnet.org you can donate to them and they're great. fully funded so super and do you have a show to plug are you uh, doing edinburgh this year i'm not doing edinburgh Yay! this year yeah come on anyway not happy about that um if you so you can go but to we my can... website just go to felicityward.com and i'll have all my felicityward.com there are gigs nat Seema, anything to plug no, no, nothing really. I've got another book out next year in June. But if you just go to Twitter, follow me on Twitter, that'd be nice. If you just tap in at Nat L-U-U, it'll always be me. It'll always <laughs> be me, Nat whatever L-U-U, comes up. That's at Nat Lassima. 
And please, if you're listening, fund Nat's films. Whoever... Just a million, a snipsy little million. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're in very wealthy times. So <laughs> Follow The Guilty Feminist on Twitter, at GuiltFemPod. Check out our Instagram, which is instagram.com forward slash The Guilty Feminist. Like our Facebook page, sign up to our mailing list to get notified as soon as a new episode is released. And please go to iTunes and rate, review and subscribe. It helps other people find the podcast. And give it five stars. Give it five stars. Um, you have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Felicity Ward, and our very special guest, Atlas Seema. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Selitsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Tony and Hannah at PBJ Live, and everyone at Warwick Arts Centre, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Francis White! Nat and Seema, Felicity Ward, and Michael! Happy birthday, Michael! Thank you guys so much for coming out, you're awesome. Thank you. This two-party system really is too binary for 2017. As a society, we're getting more gender fluid. I think we need to get more agenda fluid. Oh, Oh. really? Just coined that right there. Really good. That's Deborah. right. Um, really good. Stuff. I am so happy with myself. <laughs> I'm going to be smug for a week about that. Because when I said gender fluid, I thought, where are you going with this? Just pull something out of your ass. And whoa, what? I mean, this I is think... really undoing a lot of your good work that you do. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, ass. Like, none of that sounds like you've ever no, said sure. it. No, sure.